Hey, what's up guys? It's a stormy day here in Toronto, so if you hear some thunder and rain in the background, my apologies, there is absolutely nothing I can do. In the last engine simulator video, we made some major improvements to the physics engine. Those improvements worked great when simulating trusses and other complex structures, but unfortunately the conjugate gradient method seems to be completely unsuited to engine simulator, at least without some modifications. As I hinted at in my last video, Linear equation solvers can be extremely frustrating, and most solvers will not work for all problems. But before we talk about that, I'd like to say a quick thank you to BeamNG, Reyna, Meister, Goldwolf, and Imoigi for supporting me at the Master Mechanic level on Patreon, and thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. More about them later. There are two types of constraints that are important for Engine Simulator, positional and velocity based. Positional constraints are things like links or sliding constraints which are used to model piston to rod linkages and piston to cylinder wall contact. For these constraints, the conjugate gradient approach works great and we can officially simulate very large systems. However, it does not seem to like velocity constraints at all and shows major instability compared to the gauss seidel method. I don't know the exact reason for this to be honest and I don't want to spend huge amounts of time necessarily to get this to work. So what should we do? Quite a lot of knowledgeable people left comments on my last video about techniques that I should look into, and I did look into some of them. A common suggestion was position-based dynamics, or PBD. In PBD, constraints are satisfied by adjusting positions directly while conserving energy, instead of calculating the reaction forces of each individual constraint, updating the velocities, and so on. This method is very fast and is used mainly in games since it's stable and produces visually plausible results. My main concern with this method though is that pretty much every paper I found mentions that the technique is not as accurate as force based methods. And the elimination of the force calculation step isn't really beneficial for me since I actually need that information for some features like the dynamometer. If anyone knows of a specific source that discusses the usage of PBD for precise non-game applications with force calculations, I'd be very interested to check it out, so please let me know in the comments. I think for now, it's best to stay on schedule and just optimize what we know works, instead of looking into anything too radical or experimental. So let's see how we can optimize the gauss seidel algorithm. As our test platform, let's use the most complicated engine I've demonstrated on my channel so far, which is a V12. Previously I said V12s are the limit of what engine simulator can handle on my hardware. We'll use this gauge over here to measure performance. Frame rate is actually not a very good way to measure performance in engine simulator, but we'll talk about that another time. This gauge shows the ratio of processing time needed by the physics and fluid simulations to real time. If it goes over 100%, the simulation needs more processing time than is available. Increasing the simulation frequency will consume more CPU time until the CPU is overloaded. Eventually, the input buffer to the audio synthesizer will run out of samples since the physics simulation can't keep up, and you'll start hearing audio distortions. The audio distortions happen because the audio synthesizer will run out of samples to output once its input buffer empties, and you'll hear very short clips of missing audio, which at high speed sounds like pops and crackles. Using the unoptimized gauss seidel implementation in the publicly available version of Engine Simulator, the gauge hovers at around 62%, which means 62% of the CPU's time is allocated to simulating the engine, and the rest is either idle or allocated to things like running the game loop or rendering the interface, which has a small CPU side component, and the rest is offloaded to the GPU. Last time, we did some basic optimizations and used SIMD instructions to get around a 50% improvement in performance, but there are better optimizations. The most obvious is to take advantage of the sparse nature of our input matrix. Some of you asked for more information about how sparse matrices can be exploited, so I'll show you quickly. Our linear equation is AX equals B. However, this isn't the whole story. In our case, A is a matrix equal to the expression J multiplied by W multiplied by the transpose of J, where J is a sparse matrix and W is a diagonal matrix. Evaluating the matrix A by multiplying these three matrices together using regular matrix multiplication is very expensive and best avoided. In the conjugate gradient method, we actually don't need the matrix A directly. 
we only need to be able to calculate a multiplied by some vector p. We can separate this into three operations. So first we multiply p by the transpose of the sparse matrix j, which is a fairly cheap operation. Multiplying a vector by a diagonal matrix is just a scale operation, which is also very cheap. Now we multiply the result by j, which is another cheap sparse matrix operation. These three inexpensive operations are faster than evaluating the giant matrix A and then doing an expensive matrix multiplication of A, which is no longer in sparse matrix form, by the way, by P. In the Gauss-Seidel algorithm, things are not as simple. We actually do need to know the values of the matrix A, since we need to separate A into upper and lower triangular matrices and a diagonal matrix. Using some tricks though, it is possible to evaluate A as a sparse matrix. Sparse matrix arithmetic is a complex area and if you're interested in studying it further, I left some links in the description. The short version of the story is, instead of storing the entire matrix A, we only store the non-zero values, which makes calculations much cheaper since we don't have to do a bunch of unnecessary multiplications by zero. With the sparse matrix arithmetic implemented, the Gauss-Seidel algorithm is now around 10 times faster than it was before, which is a pretty decent improvement. Let's try these new enhancements with the V12 test engine. CPU utilization dropped from 62% to around 48%, which is a 14% reduction in CPU time and a 23% improvement overall. This allows us to run the V12 with a higher frequency, which reduces the number of audio artifacts and makes the simulation more accurate. But why is it not 10 times faster? Well, this is probably because the physics simulation is not the only thing consuming CPU time. According to Visual Studio's profiler, the bottleneck seems to be the fluid simulation now, which takes up more than twice the CPU time of the physics engine. This is something that I plan to look at in another video, since the entire fluid simulation needs a major overhaul anyway. But don't worry, I have some tricks and internal controls that are not yet directly available in Engine Simulator, and we're going to use these to simulate the absolute largest possible engine today. But first, I get a lot of questions and emails from people asking how they can create something like Engine Simulator. Well, today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, is a perfect place to start. The key is to learn as much as you can about anything that interests you, and Brilliant lets you do that with a wide variety of amazing interactive courses about math and computer science. This knowledge will seriously help you professionally and when creating challenging side projects, which is how Engine Simulator began in the first place. You might notice that we talked a lot about linear algebra and solving linear systems of equations recently. Well, Brilliant actually has an Introduction to Linear Algebra course, which covers a lot of the fundamentals of this area. A practical knowledge of linear algebra is extremely valuable for game development, and Brilliant's courses focus on putting what you learn into practice immediately with meaningful practice problems, so that you actually build that intuition and real know-how. To try all of Brilliant's features for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash great or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Once again, thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now we'll get back to building our giant engine. All engines in Engine Simulator are specified using a scripting interface. I'm definitely not going to manually write the script for this engine because it's going to be huge. Instead, I'm going to write a Python script to generate the engine for me. I tend to use Python for informal scripts and simple tools where efficiency isn't that important and I need to get it done quickly. After a bit of work, we have this script which allows me to build arbitrary engines with whatever firing order I want. In this case, we have a 69 degree V angle, 420 liter displacement, and V69 configuration. It has one bank of 34 cylinders and one bank of 35 cylinders for optimal balance. It's truly a marvel of modern engineering. The ignition display is actually there, but there are so many cylinders it's practically impossible to see without the engine running. I did some calculations and figured out that in real life this engine would be around 22 feet long, so it's probably not suited for automobile applications. Anyway, let's see if this thing will run. With default settings, the answer to this is definitely no. But we can cheat a little bit by first reducing the simulation frequency right to the limit of numerical stability. Any further and things go wrong very quickly. This is still not enough though. 
Now, I haven't really talked about this too much, but the fluid simulation isn't actually that sophisticated, and I've been studying hard over the past few months to create the new model. The old version runs at eight times the frequency of the physics engine. Otherwise, it's prone to instability. In this case, I don't really mind a little bit of instability, so we can reduce this factor to four, which means that the fluid simulation is now running at around five kilohertz. We can cheat even more by forcing the gauss seidel algorithm to exit after a very small number of iterations. We can get away with this because the algorithm uses a warm start, which means that it uses the values calculated in the previous time step as the starting point, which is usually pretty close to the solution for the next time step. So we can reduce the maximum iteration count all the way from 128 to just four iterations. Now I'll show you the side effects of doing this in a second, but this is mainly for fun, so I'm not too worried about it. All right, let's start this bad boy up. <laughs> At low RPM, most of what you're hearing is fluid simulation instability because I've lowered the simulation frequency so much. I don't fully understand what's going on here or why this engine sounds like this to be honest. Haters will say it's fake, but I promise all 69 cylinders are being simulated. If we slowly open the throttle, we can hear what this engine sounds like at a higher RPM. Notice how, because we purposefully reduced the physics engine's accuracy, the connecting rods are floating a little bit, which is not ideal. But honestly, I didn't even think that a V69 would ever be possible, but apparently it can be done without completely losing accuracy. Alright guys, I'm pretty happy with where the physics engine is at now, but I might revisit it at a later time to improve performance even more. I think Engine Simulator is just by its very nature, always going to be a program that uses a lot of CPU, and as the player of the game, part of the game mechanics is literally going to be optimizing your design and optimizing certain parameters so that the physics engine runs optimally. And I think that's kind of cool, actually, because not a lot of games expose those controls to the user. Thank you to everyone who suggested techniques in the comments. I promise I read all of them, and I really appreciate it. I know I've simplified a lot of things, but I have limited time in these videos to discuss everything that I want. In the next video, I'm going to start building the Engine Simulator 3D interface using my new game engine. This will be the official start to the Engine Simulator 3D project. It'll be a fascinating journey from where we are now to the game finally releasing on Steam, and I hope you'll stick around for the journey. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters and Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.